All right, so we'll get started and, and we'll let the, the late stragglers catch along. But um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Elise Rosemary, and I'm a vice president here at ACAM. Um, I am very glad that you're joining us about this very interesting topic of lending. Um, and then refinancing for condos and co-op buildings um, and, and capital improvements as well. Uh, tonight, we have some really wonderful colleagues and panelists joining us. Um, tonight, I'd like to start with Andrew Brecker. Uh, Andrew is a partner at Armstrong Teasdale. He was a founding partner of Schechter and Brecker, a boutique firm specializing in representing co-ops and condos for 30 years. Um, but he, is the part, he and his partner merged their firm into Armstrong Teasdale where they now represent over 400 co-ops and condos as general counsel, it's fantastic. He's a monthly columnist for Habitat Magazine and a regular lecturer at the New York City Bar um, in the CLE courses in the Cooperative and Condominium Law. Thank you so much for joining us, Andrew. Um, we have Steve Geller. Steve joined Meridian Capital Group more than 23 years ago and started the Co-op Select Group with Meridian. Uh, currently a managing director, he specializes in working with lenders uh, to build co-op specific mortgage products, giving him the ability to structure creative financing products for each specific co-op. Through his and his team's efforts, Meridian has seen over uh, a roughly 70% market share of all underlying co-ops finance in the New York, New Jersey area each year. That's fantastic. Welcome, Stephen. Um, also joining us from Meridian is Nicoletta Tagnata. Um, she serves as a senior vice president in the company's New York City headquarters. She specializes in underlying cooperative and condominium property financing. Um, after beginning her career uh, as an underwriter and analyst, she now oversees a team of originators and underwriters that focus on cooperative and condominium property. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And last but definitely not least, um, my colleague here at ACAM, we've got Matt Sabula. Matt is a director at ACAM and has been with our company for almost six years. He oversees an array of ancillary services available to ACAM, um, including commercial loans and refinancing. He also oversees multiple properties in the lending process, including both co-ops and condominiums, ensuring that each transaction is handled properly from the initiation to the closing. So thank you so much, Matt, for joining us. Um, so we're going to kick it off with um, a presentation style and an overview of this process, and then um, we encourage you to um, ask any questions that you might have at the end of today's um, presentation. And then, of course, if there are any lingering uh, questions that you have, you'll receive all of our information, and we would love for you to continue the conversation after tonight. So thank you so much and welcome, everyone. All right, so we're gonna kick it off with the overview, uh, the loan process and role of the council, the types of lenders, selecting the right lender, COVID-19's effect on the market, which I'm sure will be very interesting to listen to, um, condo loans, and then again, our question and answer. All right, who wants to kick it off? Okay, well, that's that's me, I guess. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, ACAM, for putting this together. And, and I will tell you, I've known Nicoletta since she's a little girl. And uh, Steve and Matt and I have worked together on many things. Matt and I actually have closed probably five loans in the past three months or so. Um, in any event, this is what I do. Uh, I represent co-ops and condos and I, uh, my firm handles many of these uh, financing. So let's, I'm gonna start off with something that's not on the piece of paper and I'm gonna end with it. And that is, um, this is really a team effort. Um, I always like to tell my boards that they should get all the experts involved. Um, I see some boards who never go to their accountant until the last minute. I think this is wrong. The team should be the lawyer, the accountant, management, um, good broker, if you have a good broker. I, I think you have to realize this, this burden shouldn't just be on the boards. Um, so now let's let's talk about this. It, 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 there, there are many things to consider, and I think Steve will go into this later with Nicoletta. Uh, there are many things to consider. You just don't look at one rate at, at 3.0 and another rate at 3.1 and say, well, let's take the lesser one. There are many, many differences because there are a number of players in this field. Um, you should look at upfront costs. Um, that might include uh, points. In, in other words, uh, uh, certain upfront fees that the bank wants. You should look at whether they re require engineering, environmental, um, 
they all have appraisers, but really take a look at everything. Don't just look at the percentage. Um, some banks require uh, relationship requirements. Some try to get you to move all your banking over to them. Um, you may not want to. Your manager may have a very good relationship with the bank, another bank that does favors for you. So look at that. Um, annual reporting. Many times they have strict annual reporting requirements. For example, you know, an accounts receivable, an accounts payable, uh, uh, a rent roll. They may ask you for all sorts of things every year. They will, but some are stricter than others. Um, some of them uh, may require you to escrow some money if you told them that you're going to make any specific repairs or capital projects. Um, that can be awkward because sometimes the board wants to kind of play it loose when it comes to repairs. Uh, they don't necessarily want to have to do something in the next two months or so. Um, there is a, another item here that's, that's actually not on the slide, and that is the prepayment penalty. Um, you will see that some lenders will have a very complicated and sometimes expensive yield maintenance or, or something similar to that, which is a complicated uh, method of figuring out how much you have to pay them if you get out of the loan before it matures, which happens a lot. Um, other banks will have a very simple 5% uh, in the first year or two, 4%. In the, in the last two or three years, it could be 1%. For planning purposes, it's great to have this because you know precisely what it is. Some lenders now say zero in the last year. Now, wh what do I mean by that? Just so you know, most loans, most loans, I think uh, Steve would agree with this and Nicoletta, that most loans are 10-year loans. Um, and however, the payment schedule is such that it's over 30 years and therefore at the end of 10 years, you owe money. You still owe money. Um, that's sometimes called the balloon uh, mortgage. Uh, it's not self-amortizing. A self-amortizing loan gets paid off in the time period. Uh, but most co-op loans seem to be that 10-year that loan. Well, guess what? Things happen. If, if you're on a board, you know, or if you're a manager, you know, things happen. After five or six years, you could suddenly need a new boiler. Or suddenly the engineer says, oh, by the way, you need a new roof. Or local law 11, you know, the, the, the exterior inspection might show something horrible. So it's very often that you will have to refinance before the loan you currently have matures. And that's why looking at the prepayment penalty is just very important. The last item on the list here is, is a line of credit available. Now, if you're already taking a mortgage, what do you need a line of credit? This, I think this is incredibly important. Um, it's, it's your insurance policy in case something happens. You could take a $3 million loan on your, on, on your uh, building. And you know what? If they gave you another 500,000 just in case, I, I think it's worth it. Even if you have to pay a little bit, uh, a couple hundred dollars or a thousand dollars to keep it going every year. I definitely think it's worthwhile. You only pay interest on in what you draw down. So if you don't use it, great but it's, it's a wonderful little insurance policy that you should consider. Um, if we can go to the next slide, we'll, we'll now go a little bit into the loan process. So once you've made your decision uh, with your professionals, uh, what happens is they'll, they'll give you a term sheet, certain things will happen. Um, but once you have a commitment, the bank will say, we commit to lend you money. Um, and there are many, many terms in this commitment. It's signed by you, um, it's binding by both partners. So you wanna make sure that it includes major points. Um, for example, it, it should say if they want that relationship, how much the deposit is that they want into their own bank. Um, one of the things that's very important, which sometimes they put in, sometimes they don't, sometimes you have to negotiate the number, is the use of insurance proceeds. Say you have a fire in the building um, or some other damage. If the damage is $100,000, for example, you don't really want to give that to the bank, which is, sta which is standard and used to be very standard. You don't want to give that to the bank so they would then pay off part of the loan. You want the money. It's your insurance. You want the, loan, the proceeds of the insurance policy to go to pay for the repair. Uh, this amount gets negotiated. Very often, they'll start with $50,000, which in New York, we all know, 
pays for, uh, I don't know, one, one radiator. Um, so what you want to do is you want to bump that up from 50,000. You want it much higher. Uh, this should be in the commitment. Um, also, uh, we also, in order to save money in New York, you can take an assignment of your own old loan and have it assigned to your new lender. Um, it, it's a technical thing, frankly, but it saves you a lot of money. And we like to put that in the commitment to make sure that we save, you know, 10, 20, $25,000 for the co-op while we're doing that. Um, and then one of the things that's very typical is that they require you to say, I will not uh, take on any more liabilities. And that includes contracts. So for example, let's assume that during the 10 years, um, you want to do a, uh, a repair uh, of the roof and you don't have to borrow more money. You, you have the money in your reserves and you want to sign a contract for half a million dollars. Well, they may require you to get approval for that um, before you take on any kind of obligation. And again, they may have that in there. Maybe there's a limit, but no matter what, we like to make the limit higher. So minor repairs, minor things, you know, we don't have to go to them. Now, I'm not saying they will be difficult about it. Depends on the lender, of course. But the fact of the matter is you don't want to have to go there and then wait for a reply and maybe have to explain something. It's you want your freedom. Now, lenders are lending you money. They have certain rights, but there are a lot of things that are negotiable. Um, and one important thing is, is, is there enough time to do everything? Um, I, I, frankly, I, I like to do things carefully and it may take an extra 15 or 30 days to do that, but make sure, and this is in the commitment, that you have enough time to do everything you've got to do before the commitment expires. I will tell you lenders are, are usually very liberal, they'll extend, but frankly, if you get a report and it turns out you have a number of violations in the building that they suddenly want cured. Um, I, I don't wanna rush at the last second. I'd rather have enough time. I'd rather push out the closing date 60 days rather than have an almost impossible 30 days. So if we can go to the next slide, the, oh, look at that. Um, so what happens is once you sign the commitment, there are a lot of little things you gotta do. Um, not the board, but the lawyer and management. Management plays a very big role and they make uh, it much easier on everyone when they cooperate and do their job, which they typically do. Uh, kudos to Matt, he's been a terrific person to work with. Um, you have to order a title report. Now the title report that, that reviews all the liens that might be on the property, um, violations, you know, if you have missing doorknobs, doorknobs or you have lead paint or, you know, whatever. Um, there's all sorts of violations. Some are not important. Those are the A and B violations. They're minor. But some are C violations, which are considered uh, rent impairing. We, you, you really are typically asked to do that or to make good progress into curing them. Um, the title report will also uh, tell you what mortgages you have in case something slipped by um, and, and other issues. If you have commercial tenants, uh, title report doesn't talk about this, it's a separate issue, but you have to get time to get estoppels from commercial tenants. What an estoppel basically is, is it says, hey, listen, I got a lease. This is what my rent is. There's no problem in the lease. I'm not complaining. Um, and this way the lender is, is uh, assured that he doesn't have a problem with cash flow. Because remember, the commercial tenants in a co-op pays sometimes a big percentage of the revenues of the co-op. Um, and just to give you an idea, even a, uh, a laundry contract is requires estoppels nowadays. In the olden days, we didn't do it, but now they do. Um, if, you, if you own a co-op or it's had a garage, you might have need an estoppel there. Um, doctor's offices. So be aware of that. Um, you should also, by the way, at this point, check the bylaws to see who can sign. It is not strange or unusual to say that uh, notes, promissory notes have to be signed by two officers. So you should check that pretty quickly. And of course, they're gonna require resolutions which will be prepared by the bank and the lawyer. And that has to be signed by typically all the officers, sometimes all the board members, but all the officers to say, yes, we had a meeting, we voted on this, and this is exactly what uh, has to be done. Um, and then of course, pretty immediately, you better contact your old lender 
if you have a balloon mortgage, you better check with the old lender to make sure that uh, he has the old paperwork and that he can send it over when it gets assigned to the new lender. Um, then of course we have the actual closing. Um, the actual closing um, used to be in person, you'd sit down, everybody would be there. Uh, under COVID now, everything is done remotely. So frankly, um, I don't even see my client anymore, except in a Zoom session, maybe everything's signed ahead of time. Um, I like to sit down only because things happen at the last second. You never know what's gonna happen. And typically you can make the problem go away with, with the signature of the president saying, we undertake to cure this problem in the next 60 days, or I promise to get you something within a week. Um, those are the last minute issues. So I, I actually prefer the sit down. I don't know about anybody else in the panel, but I like the old fashioned sit down closings. Um, next, um, next panel. So um, I, I think I mentioned this, uh, I, I, like, I like to get involved fairly early, not after the commitment has been signed, that's suicide. Um, I like to be brought in as the attorney to take a look before the commitment, even at the term sheet. Frankly, I like to get involved with the, with the um, actual decision on who to go with and why. Um, what happens is when you deal with Steve Geller, for example, he will give you uh, a spreadsheet and, and Matt um, to compare the various offers he's gotten. And I like to get involved with that. Um, I mean, I've been doing it for 30 some odd years. I think I've been around the block. So I certainly like to get involved. And, um, and ultimately, while this is all going on, the attorney often coordinates all the experts. So for example, and, and people involved. So for example, Matt and I will be talking about, or, or the manager himself of the building, getting the estoppels. Um, can you check to see whether the, uh, the repairs were made? Um, there's constant emails and phone calls between lawyer and manager, title company, constant calls there too, because they may come up with something for example, let's assume there was a fine from the city of $400. Well, you know, if you're friendly with the title company, you can say, listen, make this go away. We'll pay it, don't worry about it. And often they will simply take a, an agreement by the president. Um, and of course the board has to get involved because they're concerned. Um, if you can go to the next slide, obviously at the closing, the attorney reviews all the closing documents as well. Uh, next slide. Okay. Well. That's the end of my portion. I'm not promising I'll be quiet for the rest of it, but I think this is something Steve prepared. Steve, you want to take it away? Looks like you're going to get a test. <laughs> very, very good. Yes, yes. Before before we do this, this is just something cute that we do. I just want to, it just occurred to me um, as we were starting and, and just the way this whole presentation is, has been laid out. Um, I've done a few of these uh, Zoom presentations um, for the cooperator for CNYC um, on Zoom. Um, Nicolette has done them also, but I just got to tell you that this just reminds me, um, we work with 80, 90% of management companies that manage co-ops and condos. And I just, it, it, it is amazing to me how way ahead of the, of the curve ACAM is in terms of um, they're in the process of evolving and growing into these types of, of new technologies and new services. And, you know, they're constantly calling us up to, to ask us how, you know, how we see um, they can help, uh, you know, grow their presence in the market and, and differentiate themselves. So I just really want to hand it to them for doing this. Um, the other thing is, is very important for you to understand that there are different types of management companies. And I, I use a certain uh, threshold. Um, and to be honest with you, there's the management companies that work with us on their financing on their co-ops and the ones that don't. And the only reasons that there are two or three management companies left that don't work with Meridian is that they want to collect the brokerage fee. Um, we financed last year, my little group, $1.2 billion of, co of underlying co-op loans. We closed with about 25, 26 different banks a year. There is only one bank that won't work with us and that's NCB. And it's a great story. Uh, someone can call me offline. I'll tell you why they don't. Um, the short answer is that NCB brokers only really push NCB loans because NCB loans don't 
compare well to just about any other lenders products in the market, but we're not here to, to bash loans. I just wanted you un to understand that we work with every bank that is competitive on co-ops. We try to bring in more banks to compete on co-ops. Uh, we have a famous uh, a motto, uh, one God, one spouse, two banks. We always like to compete, to create competition. Um, all of the lenders that we, that we work with, none of them are comfortable um, are made comfortable with the process. Um, we, we put all of them, uh, we pit them against each other and, and, and they understand that's part of the, of the game. Um, okay, so what Andrew said about uh, comparing different offers uh, where one might be a 3% rate, one might be a 3.1% rate was, was dead on. And there's several reasons why this is true. Um, we, I, I created this little pop quiz. It's a very interesting uh, way to illustrate uh, the nuances and the differences in, in different types of banks. And let's just look at this real quickly. We're looking, let, uh, let's say you're looking for a $2 million mortgage for a 10 year term on a 30 year amortization. And you're looking at two offers. Bank A has a rate of 3.36%. Bank B has a rate of 3.41%. So let's assume the closing costs are the same. Does the closing costs have nothing to do with this? Um, bank A, the monthly payment on 3.36 is $8,825 a month, $105,904 per year. Bank B is $88,81 per month and $106,569 per year. So bank B is $55 more per month, $665 more per year, and $6,647 more over the term. So if you're Comparing these two offers, it sounds pretty obvious that you would pick bank A with the lower rate. Let's go ahead and advance the, the next slide. There's one, it's not obscure, but there's one technicality of, of mortgage loans called the interest calculation. And the interest calculation determines how each lender calculates interest. In, in the old days, and I'm talking 40, 50 years ago, before computers, um, banks dis considered a mortgage year to be 12 30-day months, just for the sake of, of simplicity. They didn't have computers to, to calculate um, at the actual number of days. So 12 30-day months made this whole process of compounding interest and amortization a lot easier to, uh, to explain, a lot easier to calculate. So 3360, the, 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 right? Once computers came out, the <laughs> computers led banks kind of take you for those extra five to six days, right? There's 365 days in the year, 366 on a leap year. So the banks that now use what they call an actual 360, which is 365 or 366 over 360 versus a 3360, you're actually paying five to six days of interest more per year. So because of that calculation, let's see what it does to the, to the numbers here. Um, the monthly payments are all the same. The annual payments, exactly as we, we described in the first slide. The difference is because you're paying five to six days of interest more per year, you're paying less principal. So at the end of the term, if you look down at the blue on the bottom, difference in balance at the end of the term, you save $7,690 with bank B because of the way they calculate interest. So the $6,647 additional monthly payments, your additional monthly dollars you're paying over the, or additional payments over the, over the term, is offset by the fact that your balance is $7,690 cheaper at the end of the term. So you actually save over $1,000 with bank B. So this is just an example of how when you and I, you know, everyone on, on the, this uh, seminar, uh, most of our experience with mortgages is with our, our units, our, 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 you know, our units, our houses, and pretty much it's all Fannie Mae and pretty much you get the best rate. You get the best rate. Now a broker can in inject, as Andrew said, points. You have to look at points and closing costs, but you know, this is one of the things, and there's a lot of these types of small details that really affect your decision when you want to uh, uh, decide on a bank. Let's go to the next slide. 
um, let's go over the different types of banks. All right. So I, I, I mentioned that we close loans with about 25 different banks a year, co-op loans. As a company, Meridian uh, closes loans with about 250 different banks per year all across the country. Um, I don't know what the numbers were last year. 2019, we closed $40 billion of commercial real estate loans. Um, all of the lenders, conventional lenders, fall into five categories. There's life insurance companies that lend on real estate. There's portfolio local savings banks, so called portfolio banks. The agency delegated underwriting servicers, that's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and HUD. CMBS originators, <laughs> CMBS stands for Commercial Mortgage Backed Securities. And these are the heartless, soulless, um, they don't even really know what real estate is or mortgages. What they do is they consider these the mortgages that they lend money on, they, they convert them immediately into a bond. And just like you could buy a 10-year T-bill that has a certain yield, they put out these mortgages and they consider them so safe that they're like a bond. They pool them together and they sell them into the secondary market. So really, real, they know very little about the real estate. We can get into that a little bit later. Um, there's a certain there's a certain type of client um, that CMBS uh, uh, loans really do serve better than anybody else. Um, the fifth one are swap lenders. Um, and these are also typically securitizing lenders, meaning they usually sell um, the loans into the secondary markets, but they're swap-based um, investment instruments instead of um, CMBS instruments or, or um, Fannie and Freddie loans, which are a different type of investment. All of them that get securitized, that get sold, get sold into a Wall Street uh, diversified portfolio account, um, a pension fund will diversify, you know, its um, its money into different types of investments. And this is one of uh, mortgage-backed securities of, of these different types are, are one of those investments. Let's go to the next um, slide. We're going to go through each one real quick and go through the strengths and weaknesses of these five types of lenders. We'll start with the life insurance lenders. Now, in, in my opinion, the life lenders, for a couple of reasons, are the most interesting lender um, that are out there. What they're lending is their life insurance premium money, right? When, when you buy a life insurance policy and you pay them every month for the policy, um, they take that money and they know they are the smartest actuarially, actuarially, they know how much they have to make as a return every year on those premiums to be to make the money to pay off the life loan when it, when they calculate you're going to die and the, they know when every one of us is going to die if I don't know if that's good or bad but so if a 25 or 28 year old couple comes in and they buy a life insurance policy the life companies take all of those policies from all of that age demographic they pool them together and they'll lend them out on 30 year mortgages Okay, because they're not going to have to pay out that life policy for at least 30 years. Um, and they have it's it, it's funny. It's not every five years like in mortgages. We have five years, seven year, 10 year, 15, 20, 25 and 30 year terms. You know, they have every single year available, um, but they have these pools of life insurance policy holders that they just pull that money together and they'll put it out on real estate. Every once in a while, they'll call us up and, and I, I, we joke that it's a sale, that they, that they offer a sale on a 17-year term or a 19-year term because they have more money in a pool of that, uh, of that term that, uh, that they want to put out. So they'll discount the, uh, the spread. Um, so let's go. Let's talk about the pros and the cons. Okay, the pros are they're they're like a portfolio bank, meaning they do not sell their loans. They they hold them for the term, and they service them for the term, and they're always there to talk to you. Um, they are they specialize really in the longer term loans. Life companies, the closing costs. Andrew said you should look at the closing costs on a life insurance um, mortgage is is similar to a Fannie Freddie agency and and the other securitizing lenders a little more a little more expensive to close the loans. Um, so they work much better on larger learn, loans. Um, life companies are appropriate for 10 million dollars and higher. Um, 
so they'll offer you incredible fixed rate terms. They'll do 30 years full term interest only, which which really even experienced uh, people in, in, in real estate finance are not familiar with because life the life companies really were the only ones that offered that. And we really um, came out with that. 2011 is when we came out with our first co-op specific life product with one life insurance lender. We immediately duplicated it with a second one, like I said, to create competition. And it has been incredible. Um, they are now a long-term loan is useless if you can't secure additional financing that you're going to need along, along the term. Okay, that 10-year loans are very popular because, as Andrew said, with a 10-year loan, you can get a, a credit line, and the credit lines are really great. The, the best way to use a credit line, guys, is, is to stretch out an assessment. You don't want to really borrow money on a credit line and keep the balance there, um, a large balance, because every credit line is an adjustable rate loan. The rate's going to adjust every month. Um, based on on the LIBOR rate at the time or whatever they're going to use when LIBOR goes away. So on an adjustable rate loan, you try not to keep it a large balance for, for, for several years, but a, a, a line of credit is the perfect thing to stretch out an assessment. If you have work you want to do, you want to assess over 12 or 18 months, you, you put the, the, the balance on a credit line, you can assess over three or four years, and you'll be paying down the principal. Um, we digress. With the long-term loans, okay, you're able to go back on a 25 or 30-year term in the application and the commitment and the mortgage docs. It says in black and white, you go back to the life company five times over a 25 or 30-year term for additional money, four times over a 20-year term. But the point is, is that that's the most liberal additional financing um, allowance of any bank, um, any bank. And not only that, you have the option to also go to any third party bank you want, any non-related third party bank to get subordinate financing. They'll allow you to do, no other lender lets you do that, puts it in their docs to allow you to do that. Um, oh, so I covered almost everything. Now, one of my biggest pet peeves, not pet peeves, one of my big, one, to me, the number one concern on a, on a co-op underlying mortgage is not even the rate, it's when you can lock the rate. You take a Fannie Mae deal or any lender, an NCB or, or any lender that securitizes with Fannie and the, and the execution is a Fannie or Freddie deal, you cannot lock your rate until Andrew signs off on your commitment. Because if you lock the rate, on a securitized loan, they buy treasuries to for the 60 days or 90 day rate lock period to hedge against rates moving up. So they, that's how they're locking the rate. Once you buy a hedge, you have to replace that hedge with the building as collateral. So if you lock a rate on a, on a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mae or any securitizing loan with a hedge, that loan has to close no matter what. So if the commitment comes out later, you didn't sign the commitment and the commitment comes out with every different onerous, you know, new term or new condition or new requirement, at the end of the day, you're going to have to agree to it because once you've locked the rate, the, the, the clock ticks, you have to close the loan. So the, with the securitizing lenders, you can't really lock your rate safely till you sign the commitment. And today it's, you're talking at least six weeks from the day you put the application in till they process the um, reports, the appraisal, the third environmental and everything, go over the reports, they submit it to the bank, they go through the committee process to submit a, com a commitment. It's, it's at least a six week pro process. What that basically means, guys, is that whatever rate you were quoted on a, on a securitizing loan is meaningless. It's, it's not the rate you're going to wind up locking because that rate's going to adjust every hour of every day for six weeks until you're in a position to lock the rate. So my number one concern when it comes to financing any co-op is, is being able to lock the rate safely at the beginning of the process. And so what we did with the life companies was, I thought, kind of smart, was we had them take their commitment language 
and it's 40 something pages long and put it in the application. So the application that you're gonna get day one is a 42 page application or 44 page application that has every single detail. Every small print requirement of the loan is in the application. Andrew, your, uh, which is who will hopefully be your attorney, goes through that application. It'll take a couple of days. He negotiates with the bank any changes he wants to make. The life companies are usually very good about this because first of all, we've done a lot of these co-ops. They've seen just about everything. And so you, you're talking about three or four or five days from the time you decide to move ahead till you can lock the raid instead of waiting six weeks. And once you sign that application, you've signed the commitment, the commitment language. It's not really a commitment. The commitment comes after the reports come out. But the only thing you have to worry about are environmental issues, structural issues, and co-ops usually 99.9% .9 of the time, if there's a problem in the co-op, you guys already know about it. So, um, and, and the bank gives you time to cure that. It's not that, that it, it, we, we see very few deals. I think there was one deal Nicoletta will tell you about <laughs> where on the inspection oil was coming through a, uh, a wall, a brick wall. Uh, and that delayed things for about a year, but we wound up actually closing, but it's a long story. But the point is, is that if there's any kind of issue like that, environmental issue, a structural issue, you guys are really probably going to know about it. Very few things come out in these reports that we don't already know when it comes to co-ops. Um, so being able to lock the rate, the life insurance upfront is, is an unbelievable thing. And the pre prepayment penalty is yield maintenance, but it's a, it's a, kinder and gentler form of yield maintenance. Um, I, I think we took the yield maintenance section out, Matt, right? I, I don't know if we're going to go into that. So let me just real quickly, I'll go over what yield maintenance is. If your rate is 4% and you want to refinance with, with two years and the two-year T-bill is 2%, then your penalty is the difference between your 4% rate and the 2% T-bill. So your penalty is 2% per year for the remaining two years. So it will be 4%. So that's typical yield maintenance. What the life company does, because they hold the loan, they don't sell the loan, they have it, they, and, and they're going to take your money if you refinance, they're going to put it back out on another piece of real estate and they're going to make a spread. They add a half a point to that reinvestment rate. So if your rate is 4%, the two-year T-bill is 2%, they add half a percent. So they consider it to be two and a half percent. Your your difference is now one and a half percent per year for the remaining two years. So your penalty would be three percent instead of four percent. And and that's why so it's a little bit gentler. When rates are this low, the most likely uh thing that will happen in the future is that that 50 basis point add-on to the corresponding treasury with the matching maturity will probably be closer to your mortgage rate because rates are in the threes and there's not very far for them to go down. So rates will likely stay the same, go up a little bit in the future. And that 50 basis points will, will most likely bring the reinvestment rate up to your mortgage rate. And you'll just have the 1% default penalty. So those are the, the, the pros. I love the life product. I do $10 million. I mean, it's gotta be a, a certain size. The only con from the life company, literally the only negative is that they're not banks. So they, they, don't, they don't require deposit accounts. They don't require you know, reserve accounts. They don't require operating accounts, but they can't make um, a credit line. They can't do this adjustable credit line that you know, every month changes. So they allow you to get credit lines from another lender. Um, ACAM that usually would come from a relationship bank and, and um, you know, we, we, would, we would likely be able to get you a credit line if you needed it, but on a life company, don't forget, 20, 25, or 30 year terms, I, I, I strongly recommend that co-ops don't look for a, a, an adjustable rate credit line because you can get into a lot of trouble putting a large balance on an adjustable credit line for 20 to 30 years. Much better to, if you need additional money to go back for a fixed rate additional round of financing. And, and again, they're the most flexible when it comes to that. I could tell you crazy stories of things that we've gotten done there that that no one's been able to ever do. 
um, but I don't want to go too too long with this. Let's go to the next the next one real quick, and we can go through that in the question and answers if you want. Um, portfolio lenders; these are local savings banks. These are banks um, that 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 are have branches in the, in these neighborhoods. They know the neighborhoods. They know the value of the real estate. They understand the markets, um, and they hold their loans for the term. Now, now the now because they're they hold the loans, they're 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 only ten year uh, terms more or less under certain circumstances there are, there there are one or two portfolio banks that have um, entertained 15 and even 20 year terms but it's very unusual to find that and you don't want a 20 year term from a, believe it or not from a portfolio bank because their um, additional financing capabilities are not as inviting as the uh, as the life companies are um, they'll give you a competitive rate you can lock the rate day one because there is no hedge. They don't buy treasuries to lock the rate. They lock the rate against their balance sheet, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, and they'll hold your rate and you'll close. And if, which means that if there is something that comes out in the commitment that Andrew or your lawyer cannot negotiate to your satisfaction and you're at an impasse, you get your money back. You can get your deposit back. They'll keep the uh, out-of-pocket expenses, the cost of the appraisal, and and whatnot. But you'll get your your um, your deposit back um, because they're local banks that hang on to the to the to the mortgage. As Andrew said, their prepayment penalty is not yield maintenance; it's a sliding scale. Um, we started this portfolio product in 2003. Uh, when the owner of the company financed Co-op City, uh, $480 million reconstruction of Co-op City. Um, and he went to Queens County Savings Bank, which is now New York Community Bank, and said, I need $480 million. I need to lock the rate up front. I need a credit line. I, don't, I can't have yield maintenance. We have to have a sliding scale penalty. We need to be able to pay up to 10% of the outstanding balance per year without a penalty, because we don't know if we need 450, 480. So if we, we take out a little extra money, we wind up not needing it, we wanna be able to give it back and, and not incur a penalty. All of these things, the bank says, well, for a $480 million loan, we'll give you all of it, all right? Day one rate lock, sliding scale penalty, unsecured credit line, pay, pay up to 10% per year without a penalty, because the bank didn't know that the owner of Meridian was going to take that product and offer it to every million dollar plus co-op in the in the tri-state area for the rest of time. And that's exactly what we did. Um, of course, the next thing we did was we duplicated that as we do with Astoria uh, Federal Savings Bank. And it's since been duplicated with about eight uh, lenders have a different version of this portfolio product. Um, this is really the most popular. Um, as uh, Andrew said, the 10 year um, uh, term is kind of the sweet spot for most loans. Most loans are less than $10, uh, 10 million. So um, it, you, usually these are the, the most uh, attractive uh, loans for you. Um, and, and, the, and with a, with a portfolio, every single portfolio lender Okay, 90% of portfolio lenders, if you want to refinance during the term, they will reduce your penalty if you refinance with them. Um, and, and, and it's only if a bank gets sold and they're not really lending to co-ops that they won't play with the penalty. Uh, but, but portfolio lenders are a very strong product for co-ops. If, if it's not the absolute best rate, all of the other features make it a better product than 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 a, a lender with um, more restrictive uh, confidence. Let's go to the next. It's number three, agency lenders. So 25 years ago, if you wanted to, if a co-op in Manhattan wanted to get a, a, a mortgage, it was NCB or HSBC. And both of them would underwrite, close the loans and sell them to Fannie Mae. They were, that was the only game in town until 2003. Um, there were some life companies back then that had not co-op specific products. Um, Guardian was one of them. Um, but Fannie and Freddie really owned the Manhattan market until we we came in and and uh, and ruined the party. Fannie and Freddie are government sponsored entities, GSEs. They're highly regulated. Their their mor their mortgage requirements, their their application requirements, commitment requirements are constantly changing. 
constantly evolving. Um, the problem, one of the problems with, with the, the Fannie Freddie uh, product is that, again, you can't lock the rate. They'll have a competitive 10 year rate depending on the market depending on where rates are, are trending. If rates are trending down, their agency loans look a lot better because if rates are trending down, your, your, your Fannie Freddie rate is a spread over the treasury until you can lock it in. So if rates are trending down and, and you get a rate of three and a quarter percent, and then two weeks later, because you can't lock the rate, it's now 3%, you're, you're gonna benefit from that. Portfolio banks don't respond to sudden decreases or increases in rates. It takes them a little longer. They offer the fixed rate, but the Fannie Freddie will give you that advantage in a declining rate environment. We're in the opposite uh, um, market right now. Over the last three months, really two months, the 10-year T-bill has gone up about 40 basis points. So people who put in a Fannie or Freddie application within the last two months, their rate is skyrocketing. And you guys know as a co-op, that is a deal breaker because your rate is going to determine your debt service, which is going to determine your maintenance, which is going to determine the change in maintenance, the increase or decrease in maintenance. So again, not being able to control when you lock a rate and what your actual rate is can really have devastating effects on your, on your budget. Um, so you get a competitive 10-year rate with the spread, but you can't lock that rate till the commitment. Um, you have straight yield maintenance without that, that um, mitigating half a point uh, uh, um, kind of uh, add on to the reinvestment rate, which is a discount. Um, the longer terms, you don't want to take a 20 or 30, 30 year Fannie Mae deal because they don't guarantee you at all additional financing. If they, if they do allow additional financing, it has to come from them and you have to take their pricing and their terms and you have no choices. And since 2008, the crash, uh, Nicoletta will tell you that there were two periods of time because of economic uncertainty where Fannie and Freddie stopped lending subordinate financing on their own loans. That's a disaster for co-ops. Um, right, so that's, that's, that's your Fannie and Freddie, depending on the market, you know, but, but I, I do very little Fannie and Freddie business on co-ops. We only do them when they're that much better or when we have to, when a bank won't take the deal. But let's go to next one, <laughs> CMBS. So, so again, I, I told you, they, it, I love these guys. I, I really like, I, I do because a, a lot of the portfolio banks will scrutinize co-ops and we have one bank in particular that we love and I'm not gonna mention the name, and we call them the hand ringers, that they will look at things, obscure things that they'll just not be comfortable with and they'll kill a deal. Literally nothing financial, nothing that will jeopardize your ability to pay. They just, they won't like a facade. They won't like, who, anyway, CMBS doesn't even really get the real estate. They don't understand it. For them, it's just an investment instrument. This is a note that is paying an X amount of interest on a piece of property that's, that, that is a very low risk. Co-ops are typically 5 to 10% loan to value. That is the safest investment in all of real estate financing is financing a co-op loan. So the CMB, let me tell you what they do, okay? The CMBS guys will write mortgages on, on, on retail, on hotels, on uh, office buildings, and they'll go up to 70% LTV, 75% LTV. And now let me tell you what that means. When you're, when you're, if your building's worth $100 million, they'll lend you 75 million, and, which is great for the borrower. But what happens in a downturn? Right. What happens when the market turns and, and the values go down, which which we're seeing right now in Manhattan, then that 75 percent LTV can become 85, 90 percent LTV. And the problem is you can't refinance it. Right. You can't refinance the balance because the same balance that you that you've been paying on the, the same balance on the loan can't be switched to another lender because it's now above their underwriting criteria. So let me tell you why CMBS lenders do incredible things with, with co-ops. And we have a CMBS lender today that is giving us a rate right around two and a quarter percent. It was below 2% two months ago. 
but they're around two and a quarter percent for 10 years, which sounds amazing. Okay. The reason they do this is that they take hundred million, $150 million of these co-ops, 5% LTV co-ops, and they put them in a pool with a billion dollars worth of other loans. And then they sell those to the, to the investment market, securitization market. And our co-ops lower the risk value of the entire billion dollar portfolio uh, package. So they will lose money on a co-op loan to make it back on the sale of this billion dollar pool. Um, so that's why we love them, okay? Because they don't really ask any other, many more questions than they have to. They'll give you the best rate. You can't lock the rate. Well, let's go through. Um, give you a very competitive rate you can play around with that rate because their rates are so far below the market. And because they sell these loans within 60 or 90 days of the closing, you can actually build in your prepayment penalty into the new rate. Meaning if the, let's say their rate is 2% and you have a 2% prepayment penalty, let's say on your current loan, and you don't wanna add that penalty to your loan because you're gonna be paying interest on it forever. You can buy up your rate on the CMBS loan. Okay, instead of 2%, um, 1% is 14 basis points, called 15 basis points. So you can raise the rate. Instead of paying 2%, you can raise the rate to 2.3%. And for 2.3%, the bank will write a check at closing for the 2% prepayment penalty that you owe your existing lender. So you don't have to add that 2% uh, uh, worth of dollars to the new loan, pay interest on it for the rest of time, you just pay 2.3% instead of two, but the 2.3 is so below the market, it's it's a compelling proposition to consider. So so you can really do some fun things with them in because of the way they're structured and how it works. Um, you can buy down the rate as well. You can, you can buy down the rate if it better fits your, your budget. Um, the cons is they'll only do 10 years, prepayment penalties, yield maintenance, which I'll be honest with you at a 2%, 2.5% rate, I wouldn't worry too much about yield maintenance. Um, credit lines will come from a third party. They allow that. And the, the availability of these CMBS loans and the pricing of the CMBS loans are really subject to the availability of, 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 of the market. Now, what does that mean? Whenever there's tremendous economic uncertainty, this whole pool selling um, stops, okay? Uh, because in those 60 days from the time that, 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 that they're putting out a rate and, and, and you close and they sell the loan, if the market is changing too quickly, they don't know what their return's gonna be. They don't know what they're, what they're gonna be able to sell that pool for. So in a volatile market, the CMBS markets pause um, and, and they, shut down for a while. So they're not always available, but depending on your situation, depending on the, on the time in the market, if we can, you know, CMBS is a great, it could be a good option. Next. Swap lenders. All right. This is quick swap lenders, very similar to, to, to CMBS lenders. They just price over, over the swap index. Um, they can do some amazing things also because, again, because of the of flexibility that they have, they're going to give you a very creative rate. You can't, you can't, you can lock your rate once you get the commitment for, for several months. You can buy these early rate locks and go out six months or nine months. You can fund multiple tranches. I'll tell you one quick story that we did. Uh, Se uh, Seward, Seward Park was a $60 million loan. We gave them a 10-year interest-only mortgage. We funded $40 million at closing. $10 million was funded 12 months after closing. The last $10 million was funded 24 months after closing, all at the same rate, at the same low, low 10-year rate. Because of the curve, we were able to lock the rate, but push off the funding so they didn't have to pay interest on the money they didn't need until they needed it. So that $10 million 12 months later met their need and the second 10 million 24 months later met their need and they got the money when they needed it without having to pay the, all that interest um, for the 12 and 24 months. Um, swap breakage, because swap lenders are based over a swap index, the prepayment penalty is called swap breakage. We may have a slide on this. Swap breakage, in my opinion, is the most preferable 
uh, type of prepayment penalty. It's a little technical why I like it better. And, and Andrew, I, I, if, I, if we can argue about this, I like it better than the 333222 penalty because uh, let's see, I think we have a slide on swap breakage we can go to. The cons are the swap market varies, the pricing varies depending on the market. So we don't know, some, they're not always competitive. And um, on, on certain swap lenders, the credit lines have to be secured. So if you get a million dollar line of credit, you have to pay the mortgage tax, which is $28,000 per million per million dollars and so that may or may not you know but again if the rate's good enough and and the structure is is saving you money that may not be um a, a deal breaker let's go to the next slide i think this is where nicoletta may be coming in it's actually a really good segue um steve pretty much has covered now the different types of lenders so how do you pick? How do your boards decide which of these lenders are the right place to go? So the test at the beginning is kind of our way at being a little tongue in cheek about it because most boards will say, oh, the cheapest rate. But each of those lenders, as you can see, has different benefits and cons as to why they may or may not be a good fit. The last example that Steve gave, great example. Building had a lot of work. We found the right lender to lock up their deal and achieve all their goals in the time frame for the work that they needed to need to accomplish. Buildings will refi for one of three reasons generally. Either their loan is coming due, or they want to lower their debt service and take advantage of low rates, or they have a capital project that they're looking to pay. Right now, with rates as low as they've been the past two years, I would say it's less about the maturing loans and more about taking advantage of low rates and addressing capital work. Um, Matt, a lot of our deals together, and you also we see a lot of local law, oil to gas conversions. We're hearing more and more about these energy efficiency projects now, local law 84, uh, so on and so forth. So what is right for one building may not be right for their neighbor and every building's needs are different. So firstly, we say identify a ballpark range of how much you need to borrow. The reason for this is that some lenders have minimums, so a $2 million loan is not going to be a fit for every bank. Similarly, not every bank can handle a 30 to a $50 million loan. So get an idea roughly of what ballpark you may need. Now, some buildings who are looking to borrow to address capital needs may not know exactly how much they need to borrow, and that's okay too. You'll have an idea of what your existing balance is. We can help you figure out exactly how much your penalty is coming in at and what closing costs might be. And then you can say, all right, we're thinking of maybe doing XYZ capital work during the next 10 years, but we don't know exactly. And we'll have at least a range. And also some of our banks, like Steve just said with the last example of the lender, may let you do delayed fundings or lock up two different tranches where you could say, I need X amount of dollars today and X amount of dollars in two years, in four years. So take a look at your capital plan, figure out what you need to do immediately, figure out the bigger ticket items, what be might, might need to be done in the next few years. When was the last time the building a, took a look at the roof? When was the last time the elevators were looked at? Um, how about the windows? Are they looking to maybe upgrade their lobbies, uh, the entrance, right? Things of that nature. Nicoletta, they should can, I just, can I just mention that what you said, it, very important. The one big mistake you see all the time is that they borrow too little. Oh yes. They won't, what, I have two buildings in the past year who in, have to refinance within 18 months of, of taking the financing. What they do is they try to say, we want to keep the debt service down so we don't care about anything else. But they don't realize, as you said, in two years, you may need a new roof. If, so that's the, a big problem. I'm glad you say, because if we say we just sound like a greedy mortgage broker, but hearing it from their attorney, they'll trust it much more. And it's true. We, you know, Steve and I are both doing this a long time. We have refinanced loans that we've done like you said, 12 to 18 months ago. And part of that is a function of just what rates have done. And part of it is just, it, this is a crazy market. These new mandates by the city, it's sometimes even in the most diligent boards, hard to predict some of these mandates that are coming out. Local law 84 didn't even exist a couple of years ago. So even with the best buildings, it's sometimes a little difficult to, to plan ahead. Uh, management is also very helpful in this because they're seeing it amongst a lot of different buildings. So definitely talk with your agents about what they think or what they're seeing other buildings look at. Another consideration, they should take a look at their reserve account position. How is their cash position? Some buildings will uh, refinance to replenish their reserve because they may have actually drawn on it to recently do some work. So we see that sometimes as well. 
depending on your reserve position, it may make more sense for you to take a longer term, or that might be a detrimental thing for your building. And lastly, how often does your board turn over? You may have a really active board right now filled with people who have a good financial sense or who can really take a look down the pike longer term. Um, but you want to make sure you're not locking the hands of future boards who may have a completely different mindset or different goals that they're trying to accomplish. So you, you want to consider all options. Next slide, please. All right, so that brings us to today. Um, as we are knocking the door on almost one year of COVID, which I can't even believe that, um, what has this meant for lending? What has this done to the, the mortgage world, to co-op borrowing, and so on? So in the best of times, the refinance process is long. It can be anywhere from 60 days to 120 days in a good environment. From the day that the co-op decides where they're going to apply, they then still have to go through a very long process. They have to get third party reports done. They have to go through a series of due diligence. They have to go through a credit review. At some point, the legal work will start. And all of these take some time in the best of times. So once COVID started, everybody starts working from home. Some of these banks weren't even equipped to switch to remote. You know, they have physical files, if you could believe it. Uh, with, that they're carrying from one department, from the appraisal department to the credit review department. So what ended up happening is that the process that was already two to four months started taking three, four, five times more while everybody tried to figure out how do you move a physical file when nobody's physically in the office. This ended up in a really long backlog in the pipeline of deals that were already at these banks and everybody had to figure out how to work through that. The way that some lenders worked through that is they started instilling minimum loan amounts to slow down the influx of deals, or they raise their rates so that they were no longer the most attractive deal on the block. Again, designed to slow down the flow of deals coming in through the door. This is where the one to $5 million co-ops really got hurt the most because a lot of the banks said, we're not looking at anything less than $5 million. Next slide, please. So what happens from there is co-ops have to put out money. Uh, lenders have to put out money, excuse me. Whether, <laughs> whether they're lending it on co-ops or what they were looking at before, which may have been anything from hotel financing, commercial real estate centers, office buildings, retail establishments. Some of these no longer made any sense, right? Who's lending money to an office building where nobody's paying rent? Who's lending money to restaurants when the tenants are completely not paying rent? So it completely changed the outlook of what's considered safe uh, leverage standpoints, vacancies obviously took a huge hit, so collections are being analyzed more closely. But at the end of the day, these banks have to put the money somewhere. Inflation is still happening at two and a half to three percent per year, so that dollar sitting in your drawer is going to be worth 97 cents 12 months later, and that's going to be worth 94 cents 24 months later. And we're sitting here almost 12 months into this process, so it wasn't like the banks could suddenly say, We're just not going to lend until this all sorts itself out. What this meant for co-ops, next slide please, is that the banks who suddenly were not lending on some of these riskier asset types, like the vacant office buildings or restaurants that were not even opening their doors, is they come out of the woodwork and they say, what's a safe product? Co-ops are generally low leverage to begin with, but especially in this environment where it's people's primary residence and they're not paying rent to a landlord. This is people's primary home. A lot of people stuck it out in New York City, myself included, uh, all through COVID. So COVID wasn't changing that. These were still very safe assets. So even though we already had a nice pool of banks to work with in all these different lending types, we now have lenders that are coming out of the woodwork saying, we'll give you a bucket of money. Where is everybody? Where do we need to be to price it? This is great for the borrowers because now you have even more competition. Somebody wants to undercut the market to try to tie up this business. So last year, I think Steve mentioned, uh, I'm here 17 years, he's here 23. Last year was our best year and in the middle of COVID. I mean, it's it's almost inexplicable, but this is a good asset we're, we're talking about. Um, and that's great for your borrowers. It's great if you're on a board, it gives you a lot of options. And our job is to help you figure out what those best options are. Steve, did I miss anything? The who moved my cheese, I'll let you do. You're muted. We can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, if only you could do. If only you could do that in real life, Nick. Um, <laughs> essentially, um, 
The problem with most mortgage brokers in the past is that they get a little too chummy with two, the one or two or three banks that they work with. And there's, there's sort of this really, you know, uh, and, and, and even with lawyers, some lawyers, some real estate lawyers get so comfortable with the mod letter that they've already done and used 15, 20 times that they want to try to send deals to that bank, even if you know, there are other banks that are better that they're not familiar with. You know, thankfully, Andrew's not like that. That's why he likes to get involved at the beginning. And um, but at the end of the day, we have to recognize that this market is always evolving. And the beauty of Meridian is that, you know, I could tell you I financed one point two billion dollars last year. Nicolette and I financed one point two billion dollars last year is an unbelievable number. It really is. Um, and it's an it's an impressive number, and we would be the fighter pilots anywhere in the world except at Meridian, where they finance forty billion dollars with two hundred and fifty different banks. So we get kind of laughed at, which is fine. But at the end of the day, from your perspective in the co uh, from the co in the co op market, there are no other brokers. I'll be honest with you, there is no other broker I consider to be competition in just from the fact that he doesn't have the relationships that we have. He doesn't have the ability to create the products at the banks. When we understand how each lender works, how they, how how their lending works, how their um, their their profit has to come in, and, and what their profit models look like, and what their capabilities are, we work with the, with that information with these guys to come up and do things that nobody else can do. I'm gonna give you a quick example. We financed a, a co-op on East 79th Street. It was about 15 million dollars or 13 million dollars for 15 years interest only. And, and, and three years later, they, the president came back and he said, you're not going to believe this. We have two humongous projects. I need to borrow another $13 million. Okay. So he goes, but I don't want now almost $30 million to come due in 12 years because that's a killer. If the rates are up, he goes, can the second round of financing go for a longer term than the first round of financing? Right. So we happen to do this with a life company. And I, and I said, I don't, how, how can you have a second round of financing, have a longer term than the first round of financing? And I don't, I even think Andrew would tell you, it's not something he's ever really seen. I never saw it. I never heard of it. So I, I told him I, I, I had, I didn't think it was possible. I called up the life company. I asked him, he said, how can we, you know, how can you do it? The next day I called him up and I asked him a question, the, the life company. I said, if we did this loan, two years ago for 30 years, right? We did a 30 year loan with these guys. And two years later, they wanna come back for another $15 million, but they only want it for 15 years. They don't want the second piece to be 30 years, only one of 15 years, could you do that? And he said, of course, it doesn't have to be coterminous. So I asked him, what diff the day after closing, if you were to do the second round for 30 years, the day after closing, what difference does it make to you which loan closed earlier? Took him a week. He came back and he got an approval for the second round of financing to go out 30 years while the first round stayed in place with 12, with 13 years left. And, and it was just, again, understanding how a bank works and being able to go to them and have them do things that, that they didn't think they could do we, is, is, is the biggest strength that we have. That's why I really don't consider that we have competition and I'm, and it's not a boast guys it's it's from a practical standpoint um, it's just where we're at right now so the who moved my cheese is being able to if it's a book it's a famous book it's like 28 pages you guys should buy it and read it about two little mice and somebody moved their cheese and one mouse stayed there and waited and hoped that a cheese would come back and the other one went out to look where the cheese now went it means in with the market's changing you have to constantly go out find the opportunities because if you don't somebody else will and uh, that's been that's been the fun can i um, can i can i chime in here first off i don't know about cheese issues because i'm lacto intolerant <laughs> however i will say this and and i work with every broker in new york um and I have with, with Stephen Nicoletta. The worst situation I ever had was probably about 10, 12 years ago. It, it was a horrible situation. And I worked with Meridian. And because they're so big, and I'm not saying this just to <laughs> make friends with them, they, they're so big, they went to the bank and they shoved something down the bank's throat that I never thought could happen. And it worked out. And, and this was a long process. I, I, it was ulcer creating problem. But because Meridian was so big, 
they got the bank to say, okay, okay, because the bank realized that Meridian brings in so much business to them. So, for, you know, I, I do respect Meridian tremendously because of that. And let me mention one other thing that Steve kind of hinted at. Um, as far as the type of lenders, I, I must say this. I happen to like the good old local guy who gives you the uh, portfolio loan, white bread, nothing fancy. And the reason I like that is, I'll give you an example. Three years ago, we closed a loan in the lower west, in the um, west side, lower portion of Manhattan. And a month later, three quarters of the building went up in smoke. I called up the lender and I said, I don't know how to tell you this, but you got a problem. Not only did they, you know, uh, didn't require payments, not only didn't they panic the board, two and a half years later, they gave them more money and it's still not totally open after, after three, two and a half years, but they worked with us because it's a local bank. They knew what was going on. They understood co-ops. They understood how safe the investment was on their part. And I kind of like not having an insurance company, no offense, Steve, that's in Virginia or, or Chicago. Iowa. <laughs> you know what? I like vanilla sometimes. So that's my two cents. Okay. Yeah, we, yeah. I guess I'll do this because Steve, you're not involved with this too much. Well, Nick, but Nick, Nick, yeah, you, you and Nick can can go through this. I, I, yeah. Okay, so basically, the big difference here is that the condominium doesn't borrow money secured by real estate because the condominium association doesn't own the real estate; the individual people do. And in fact, condominium loans, like I'm going to explain, wasn't legal in New York until about. 12 years ago or so, or 15 years ago, maybe. Um, and now it is. And what happens is the board says, we can't give you a security, any real estate. We'll give you the stream of income, the, the right we have as the board to collect uh, common charges. That's what we're going to pledge to you. Um, so it's a little strange. It's not as secure to the lender. And that's why a lot of lenders just don't want to do that. They know bricks and mortar. Um, so these loans... They vary. Um, I know some lenders that, that only make it very short. They talk about the useful life of the product. So I've seen a lot of seven-year loans in, for, for uh, condos. And condominiums, for some reason, prefer not borrowing money. They prefer just assessing it over time. But this is necessary. Um, we don't do a lot of them, and we represent a lot of condominiums. We don't do a lot of these. And as I said, I don't think Meridian does either. Um, Nicoletta, you have any comments about condo loans? Actually, I think Matt was going to jump in a little bit. Yes, we do them. Okay, um, sorry, Matt, Matt. do you want to add here? Not a problem. So now that, you know, Andy, Nicoletta, and Steve have done most of the legwork, it, it makes my job a lot easier. <laughs> um, we do manage both condos and co-ops, and obviously condos face the same sort of issues as co-ops. You'll have your local law 11, you'll have the new uh, energy local laws coming up. So there are ways in which condominiums can obtain financing, and, and you already touched upon it. Uh, these are also term fixed rate loans. Uh, usually I've seen them from ranging from five to 15 years. Um, the way these lenders structure these loans, you know, they'll give you a drawdown of let's say you'll take, you're planning a million dollar facade repair project. Um, you'll obtain the loan and the lender will say, we'll, we'll let you draw down on that million dollars over a 12 or a 24 month period. Well, you're only gonna be paying for the interest on whatever money was drawn down on. And then whatever amount was out of that million you um, drew on will be um, converted into a fully amortized loan, which is then paid off over whatever the term that was agreed upon and the commitment was. Uh, the advantage of these sort of serial loans is that you as a condominium, you can prepay this loan with no prepayment as long as it's prepaid with internally generated money. So this is a way for you to, you can stretch out an assessment. So you can take a 10 year loan or a low debt service and then assess over three years to pay back whatever the outstanding balance on the loan is, um, allowing you to, you know, have no prepayment penalty after you make that, after you repay the loan within, within the three years. Uh, when it comes to the underwriting and the parties involved in the, in the loan process for a condominium, it's very similar to, to your co-op. You want to have your attorney like Andrew, us as a managing agent, if there is a broker involved, um, 
work together from from start to finish to make sure that it's you know it's a smooth process. There's no hiccups along the way. Uh, you'll go through sort of the same underwriting parameters. There will be third party reports conducted on the property, and uh, basically 60, 90 days to close when you have the money that you need to do the work. There is also another way a condominium can uh, obtain financing. Um, if the condominium association owns the superintendent's unit and it has its own tax and lot, you are able to take out a mortgage on that super's unit. It's still considered a commercial loan since you know condominium association owns the superintendent's uh, unit. And those are usually also structured as a five to 10 year product. You can do a fixed rate for that amount. You can also structure it as a balloon payment with a 25 to a 30 year amortization schedule. Uh, so those are just the two ways that a condominium can go about obtaining a commercial loan. Andy, I'm not sure if you touched upon the owner's approval. For yeah, the that's what I was, I was just gonna mention, Matt. The one major, major difference, besides the fact that there's no uh, real estate being collateralized, being secured is that almost all bylaws of condominiums state that when you take a loan, usually there's a limit over a hundred thousand or whatever, you need approval of the, of the unit owners. In a co-op, the board can make this decision. They do not need a vote of the shareholders. In a condominium, you need typically a vote of the unit owners. The other issue which people forget is that it's also very common in a condominium for that to require approval of the unit owners for certain jobs. So for example, if you wanna do a capital improvement, like redo your lobby for half a million dollars, you can't just say, well, you know, we'll borrow the money, get the vote on that. You actually need a vote for the work itself. So keep in mind, before you do anything, check your bylaws for not only the loan, but also for the job you're gonna be doing. Yeah, and this is pretty much the first step that I, you know, convey to any board that comes to us requesting some sort of financing is to reach out to your attorney, have them look at the bylaws. You don't want to incur any fees with, you know, going through the loan process. And once you're halfway through it, you're going to realize that you need a majority vote from the ownership in order to even obtain finance. Okay. I guess at least that brings us to question. And thank you guys. This was extremely informative. Um, thank you so much for all of this. Um, so we're now going to open it up to our Q and a session. We are running a little bit late. So if, if we don't answer everything tonight, we do encourage you to um, email us and we will definitely get back to you. Um, so I have a few that have come in so far. Uh, what type of lender is currently offering the most competitive loan packages? Well, it, it depends on it depends on the size of the loan. Um, obviously, ten million and above, you have different options. Um, ten uh, uh, seven million and below, you have to. So you really, we have to take a look at. Let me just explain to you what we do, guys. It's very important. Um, we don't do it like that. We we take a look at your current mortgage, your current your budget your arrears, we take a look at your current financial situation. We look at what you need to do over the next seven to 10 years from a CapEx standpoint. We really kind of help you put together um, a, a new loan that's gonna address everything. And then we're gonna show you every single lender that's gonna compete for your loan. Um, and we can st we, have a, we have a spreadsheet that literally has 20 columns that, that can fit 20 different <laughs> offers. We don't usually do that many, but we will give you, we'll start off with a, a, a large number of choices and then you guys will whittle it down to the ones that you're most interested in. And then we make, um, we can make that determination with you. And Steve, don't that. forget that each lender might give you a couple of alternatives and one might be a better deal than the other. So your spreadsheet is not just 20 different lenders. It could be 10 different lenders, but 20 different offers. It's exactly, it's 20, it could be 20 offers. It could be 20 offers from five different lenders. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Okay, thank you. Um, how long is it taking to refinance a co-op's mortgage right now? Too long. <laughs> I'm getting gray hairs as a result. So when, let's think about this. I think it was the end of April, again, when we were kind of new in this quarantine thing. I did a similar seminar and my one takeaway that I wanted anybody participating then to take from it was 
if your loan is coming due in the next year, don't kick the can down the road and say, well, we have 12 months. Let's just like wait and see because the process is taking infinitely longer and it's not any better almost, you know, 10, 12 months later. It's taking everything so much longer. Please don't wait until the last minute. Uh, we have quite a few loans that have had to get maturity extensions because the boards just waited till they were 60 days out from their maturity date. Do not do that to your boards. Start the conversations early. Uh, some of our lenders even offer a forward rate lock. Just whatever you think it is, start it sooner than you think because the general process is not less than 60 days. Um, I think of all our lenders right now, the shortest is probably 60 to 70 days, but the real time for a lot of these banks is not less than 120. So Cove should keep that in mind. Thank you, good advice. Um, what are the going rates for Sierra loans? So it really depends on which lender is currently in the market. And if you're looking for ex an extended drawdown period, which I mentioned, um, I've seen this zero loans price today anywhere between three and a half to over 4%. It really depends on the structure of the loan and the loan amount. All right. Um, do you expect rates to drop further in the future? <laughs> Stephen, you like this one. That's my favorite, <laughs> favorite, favorite question. Is so let, let me give you, let me give you my, my, the answers that I'm going to, if you ever ask someone that question and they give you a serious answer, don't ask them another question. All right. <laughs> because at the end of the day, nobody knows. And if I'm, if I predict anything and I'm wrong, I don't, I don't suffer. OK, you guys do. So at the end of the day, what what I'm telling what I will tell you is if I knew that, I'd rather tell you the lottery numbers. That's one of my jokes. Mm -hmm. But what I tell people today, especially today, is that you lock a rate today and you get that loan closed. And if in a month from now rates are down 10, 15 basis points, it doesn't make a difference because from here you have so much more to lose because there's so much more room for rates to go up than there is for rates to come down. So if rates go, if rates come down 10, 15 extra basis points, you are exposing yourself to the possibility that they're going to go up a half a point, 75 basis points. We just lost almost 50 basis points in the last two and a half months. So it doesn't matter where rates are. As a co-op board, you guys have a lot of responsibilities. Speculating on the market is not one of them. You're not expected to do it, and you don't want to do it. You don't want that responsibility. You make the best decision today based on your budget, based on the rates, the availability, and what the new loan looks like and how it fits into what, you're, what you need. And if it fits, you do it. And, and you don't look back. And if rates come down, you just know that they could have gone up and it would have killed you. Coming down a couple a couple basis points, 10, 15, 20 basis points. So what's it going to do? You divide that by the number of shares by the by 12 months, it's pennies. Literally, it's 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 a couple dollars per share or pennies per share. So that that possibility of rates coming down a little bit is nowhere near as bad as if rates spike. And that that can hurt you much worse than rates coming down can help you. And that's my official answer. All right. Take <laughs> it to the bank. I feel All right. Are you guys seeing loans right now associated with the Climate Mobilization Act? Well, not not loans, but 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 we see cash out for that purpose. Um, and yeah, a, and lot, a lot of boards have started including the um, local 97 CMA component in, in the refinancing process as a part of their capital planning for the future. Um, so yeah, me personally, I know that I do have a lot of conversations with the boards considering refinancing to include additional funding as a cushion for potential projects down the road. If I'm not mistaken, that similar to local law 11 will have sort of a future time frame. It's not required for another two or three years. And Matt, you probably know better than me. I, I, for some reason, I have 2024 in my mind. So that's one of the examples of if you're about to refinance now, you might not be talking right. about that today, but you really should be thinking about it if you fit the criteria of buildings that will need to be dealing with that. Yeah, and is that something that is specific to co-ops again, or is there um, options for condos as well? It's, it's really both co-ops and condos. You know, the energy related local laws relate to any property over 25,000 square feet in the five barns. If I was, let me just mention, yeah. Nicoletta, this is in light of what you said, 
Um, there are times when a, a building says to me that, you know, they have work, um, so they want to refinance, but they're not sure exactly what. Sometimes I suggest to them that they hire an engineer mm -hmm. to really get a very good idea. I know that the lender is going to hire an engineer, but you know what? For future planning, if it turns out that an engineer comes in and says, you know what, you are going to need a new roof and new elevators within the next five years. You know what? That's the kind of information a board should have. 100%. So it's, it's not uncommon for me to say, do you really know what you need? Why don't you hire an engineer? He doesn't have to do specs, you know, expensive specs, but he should go through your systems, your building wide systems to see what you will need. Okay. And, and often they, they do that. It's worth the investment, I think. Let me add 100% um, that even if a building is insured, depending on which bank they're thinking of, they can sometimes lock in the rate and then even still lower the amount. So that's really generally for a portfolio lender, not one of these hedge-based lenders. But again, if they don't want to put the cart before the horse and they're not sure if the cart is the refi or figuring out how much money they need to borrow, we can still be having those conversations with them and sort of help guide them. You and they can have those conversations with them and help guide them because one does not necessarily preclude the other. So if they want to take advantage of rates, they still can have those conversations while they educate themselves on what their needs might be. And and guys, really quickly, that that works both ways. And we have we have handled this both ways. And it's very interesting on the Dakota um, the Dakota didn't know how much exactly they would need. They were still doing the uh, engineering analysis and they were replacing that unbelievable roof and the facade. And so what, what they wound up doing with the life company was locking in a smaller amount, an initial amount of, of the loan during the beginning of the process. And then two or three weeks later, when the reports came in and they, they identified the, the total amount that they needed, they locked in a second round of, of money it was all blended together and the rate was blended together. But that was one of the interesting ways that on the life company, you can handle things like that. And on the other hand, as Nick said, on the, from a portfolio bank, you do the opposite. You put the application in for the most money you think you're going to need. And then by the time you get to the commitment, you could scale it back. Cause once the loan gets approved at a higher number, it's not a, just, you tell them you're going to take $2 million less. They don't care. Um, because you already approved at the higher number and you can change that amount at the commitment, which is, you know, could be four, six weeks later. Um, so depending on the bank you choose, we would, we would handle that in different ways. That's great. Thank you. Um, why would a co-op take an interest only loan versus an amortizing loan? This might, be, this might be Steve's favorite question. Other okay. Than the one All right. Really question. quickly. I I've been, I've been, moderating the, 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 the finance seminar at the Cooperator Expo for 20 years and 18 years. And, and it would be the same thing every year and I would get a little bored. So one year I decided to pick a fight and I made a whole section on, on espousing in, why you should take an interest only loan because I wanted people to start yelling. And let me tell you why a co-op today should take an interest only loan. There's the, all right, so this is, this is my speech. Co-ops are 5%, 7%, 10% loan to value which means you're, you're way under leveraged, okay? If you go into a loan, a 10-year loan at 7% at LTV and you're interest only, two things are gonna happen over 10 years. Every 10-year arc, arc from year one to year 10, don't, you know, who knows what happens in the middle, but in every 10-year arc in the history of financing in the city, the real estate has been worth more at the end of 10 years and the dollar has been worth less at the end of 10 years. And even if you say, even if we call 2% inflation, let's say it's 2% inflation, which is considered no inflation, that's 20% on a straight line over, meaning your dollar is worth 80 cents at the end of 10 years on a straight line. It's worth a lot less than that because my point is, is that your is, real estate is self amortizing, meaning your loan to value is going to be less after 10 years, even if your mortgage balance is the same because of those two things, because the real estate's going to appreciate in value and the dollar is going to depreciate in value. So even if you're interest only and your, 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 your loan amount stays the same, you're fine. Now, that said, we have a very powerful feature on the portfolio banks and the life insurance company allows you to do something very cool. The life company, one, one of our life companies and all of our portfolio banks will allow you to take an interest only loan. And then once per year, you can make a principal, an optional principal pay down. You could, you could, you could pay down an amount of your principal without a penalty. 
On the portfolio banks, it's up to 10% of the loan amount. So if you have a million dollar loan, the first year you can pay up to $100,000 towards your principal without a penalty. And the beautiful thing is when you make those optional, every time you make one of those optional payments, which you can make once a year, the bank recalculates your monthly payments lower right away. For the rest of the loan, your monthly payments are, are lower. If you do it again the next year, they recalculate it lower again. That's better than an amortizing loan because if you take a 1030, you're paying amortization, you're paying principal every single month, but you're not getting any credit for it. Your payments stay the same. So the, the portfolio banks let you do up to 10%, which co-ops don't really have, right? Let's face it. And the life company will let you go up to 5%. And again, 5% on a longer term loan is, is, a, is a more reasonable uh, figure, but it is an option. Now, let me tell you one of, one of the reasons why we like this with the, with the life company, with a, with a 20 or a 30 year term, guys, if, if, if your board today says, well, we're gonna take a 20 year interest only or a 25 year interest only loan, it's great, it's fine. It's probably the best decision, but it's possible that a future board with a, with, a, with a different economic situation might wanna start paying down their mortgage. If, if rates start going up, start shooting up, well, if rates start shooting up, you're gonna make more money, right? With that, with that surplus in the bank, then you're paying on the loan amount, on the, on, the, on the mortgage. But if you wanna start paying down your mortgage because rates are going up and your next mortgage is, the, the debt service will be higher, one of your options is to start making those amortization payments. So you're not tying the hand of a future board. You're giving them the opportunity to amortize the loan, even though you took interest only. So interest only today from a financial fiscal standpoint on co-ops, it's a very good move because you're, 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 you, you don't, you don't, the fi financial people will tell you, don't take an amortizing loan because what you wind up doing is you're paying for a loan, a, ten, a loan that you don't owe for 10 years with present value dollars. You're paying today, you know, today's dollars for a loan you don't, you don't owe, you don't really have to pay off until for 10 years. Interest only loans will, you know, lower your debt service, um, improves your budget, gives you flexibility. Now, when you take an interest only loan and you lower your monthly payments, that money is not you're be, not being lost. The money that you you would use to pay down your principal isn't being lost. It's not going anywhere. It's staying with you. So if you, what, one of the things we recommend is budget your maintenance as though you were amortizing, not necessarily a 30 year schedule, maybe a 40 year schedule, P pretend from your budgetary standpoint that you were amortizing on a 30 or 40 year schedule. That's the maintenance you're going to collect. You're going to pay out interest only, and you're going to, you're going to reserve you're going to contribute to your reserve account the difference. Now, that con contribution to reserve account can go to pay the, every year the, 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 the optional payment, or you accumulate it to pay for future work that you don't have to borrow for. So when you take an interest-only loan, you can, you can really manipulate the, the co-op's finances in a way that really can help the shareholders in a lot of different ways, instead of just kind of forcing, you know, paying off this principal, which, which, which today on a five or seven percent LTV co-op loan is not in the top ten um, uh, priorities of a, that a co-op board has to consider. There are other points of view, however, and I don't necessarily <laughs> agree with everything Steve just said. So let's let's put it that way. I've heard I've heard that there, that the older generation does feel a little different oh. about it, but. <laughs> Yeah. Fighting words, Andrew. I'm going to be 60 years old, God willing. But the, but the weeks, fact so. of the matter is, I, I would agree with you when there's inflation that you might as well take interest only because the dollars 10 years from now are worth a lot less. But in a period where there's only 2 or 3% inflation like we have for the last couple of years, the fact of the matter is if you don't have forced amortization at all, then what happens is if you borrow a million now, you're going to have to borrow a million to pay it back. And if you need some work, you'll have to borrow on top of that. Whereas if you have any kind of amortization, if you borrow a million now, later on, you'll only have to pay 800, which means even if the rates are the same, you'll have $200,000 extra in a, in a way you, you forced yourself to save money. And you know what, Steve, you can say all you want about boards uh, creating more income, uh, more revenues to put away and do that. They don't want to do that. Co-op boards do not want to do that. So in any event, I think there are times to use interest only. And I think times where co-op boards who should be conservative with what they do, because it's not their money, it's the shareholders' money. I think sometimes, and it's not a lot of amortization, Steve. 
We're talking about a 30 year schedule in 10 years. It's not a lot. It's about 18, nine, you're right. It's about 18 yeah. to 20 so percent. So we disagree there a little bit. No, no, no. It, it does depend on the circumstance, yeah. but yeah. Well, thank you. That was very spirited. We appreciate that. And I'm sure both of them are excellent uh, advice from different perspectives, which is why you are all here tonight. Um, so we're going to wrap this up. Maybe if you want to give a one, you know, a little bit more for us to think about as far as next steps, that would be great. Um, whoever would like yep. to go first. Thank you. Sure. My, uh, my advice would just be that one day to the next, things can really be different. Um, if you'd like to reach out to us offline or after this, we can give you charts of the wazoo to show you what just in the past 10 days has happened in the mortgage market. So, um, you know, what's what's good one day, a week later is could be a completely different picture. An hour later could be a completely different picture. Um, but just in terms of real time, what's happening right now in the mortgage market, if you're interested about rates, reach out to us and we'll be happy to give you some more insight. No, and it's even it's even better than that. In other words, if you come to us and, and say, could you take a look at our mortgage? Could you analyze um, the possibilities of refinancing, what it would look like, what the penalty is, what the savings are, how much, that, that's all free. And, and it doesn't cost anything. We do it, we update it. And, and Matt will tell you on the sales cycle on co-ops is about six months long. And we have to do this about 50 times on each one. And we and it's fine, it's, we have it all prepared. If you have questions, you're not sure you, you're ready, but give us a call, let us show you what the market looks like and let us show you what your mortgage looks like. And if it makes sense, it makes sense. I tell people all the time, thank God this is a, a numbers game and not a beauty contest. I wouldn't get a deal. But th because it's numbers, you know, we have a chance. So uh... the only thing I would say is we're at historically low rates now. It is amazing how low the rates are. If there's any chance that you'll need to refinance or, or because of a maturity issue or because of work, take a look at it now. You know, I thought 4% was low, Steve, and now it's... I thought when it went from eight to five, I, I you know, Andrew, we once nice. went, we once went to the cooperator and I had baseball jerseys printed with Meridian in the script and it's everything sewn on. It said underlying co-op loans, 10 years, six and a half percent, six and a half percent was such a crazy number. We embroidered it on baseball shirts. I should have worn it. I never and got one. I still, no, no, it was for the, we didn't give them out, but the oh, point, it was oh. literally, it was what we all wore. The point is, we've never seen anything like this. And I'm sick of saying historically low rates. But when you get a 10-year rate in the twos, that starts with a two, that's all you need to, to, to know. Sick. It's, it's like no interest. It's, it's insanity. It's as close to free money as there is. So at least yeah. I want to thank uh, ACAM. Oh, well, we want to thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you all. You guys have been so helpful to all of our clients. And we really appreciate working with you. Um, your advice is is remarkable and we really can't thank you enough. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Nicoletta. Um, all of our information is listed here and we're more than happy to continue the conversation. Um, you know, agree or disagree, <laughs> but always, always on the same side. So we're here to help you and we really appreciate everything that you as our clients do for us. And thank you for uh, attending tonight's conversation. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. And Andrew and I are the same age, so I it wasn't <laughs> disrespect. You all look great. You can interview us any day. All right. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.